Um, I wanted to do this presentation um, with Lauren Davies from Pullman and Comley. Um, I work at uh, Eagle Ridge Investments and uh, we do investment, we do investment management and financial planning. Um, I'm a certified financial planner and I work on the planning side. So I focus on doing financial plans for our clients. Um, and I thought it would be a great time to do this presentation, talk in general about getting your finances organized because it's such a great time of year. You know, it's January, it's the new year, it's the new you, time to get everything organized. Um, and also with COVID, um, you know, some people have had a lot of more time on their hands at home. Um, some people with small kids would disagree with that, but a lot of us have had more time on our hands and it's a good time to address some of these things that you might have put off before, like getting your finances organized or getting your trust and state documents organized, which is what Lauren's going to talk about um, in a little bit. So onto the money front, um, a lot of the questions that I run into, and the biggest one that everybody wants to know is, am I going to have enough money? Am I saving enough? You know, people want to know what their retirement look like. And so it's just a really good time to see if you're um, organized and on top of things. So. Um, for the planning front, you can either do your financial planning with someone like me or someone at your financial institution, or you can try and do it on your own. So I just sort of want to go over what some of the basics of financial planning is, you know, what some of the basics are and why it's so important that you do it. So in financial planning, rather than just looking at the investment side, we look at the entire financial picture. So we're going to look at your investments your cash flow, how much money do you have coming in? How much money do you have going out? What are you saving? How are you investing it? Do you have your insurance in place? You know, what about your taxes? And do you have your, um, your estate planning documents taken care of? So we look at the financial, the entire financial big picture. Then we sit down with clients and we look at what their long-term financial goals are. And then we set short-term financial goals as how they're gonna get there. Then we move on and we develop strategies as to how they're going to achieve those goals. Um, and then, as I said, I work with our clients and once we finish the plan and gone through it, we, you know, it, 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 it's an ongoing living plan that we monitor and adjust regularly for um, different life events. You know, if people have a, a new baby or a job change or, you know, switch jobs, anything like that, um, we would go back to the plan and take a look at it and adjust accordingly. And it's so, I think the reason that um, you know, doing financial planning is so important is it gives you peace of mind. A lot of people don't like to think about money and they would prefer to sort of stick their head in the sand and hope that everything's gonna be okay. But you know, really addressing it and getting on top of it gives you peace of mind, you definitely feel better and it reduces any stress that you have about it. It also makes it easier to make financial decisions and make sure that you're staying on track you know, if we put a budget together, are you sticking to your budget? Are you going to re reach your short-term goals and your long-term goals? Um, with regard to making financial decisions, for example, I had a client that um, she wanted to take her whole family on an expensive vacation and they weren't gonna go because she felt that they couldn't afford it. When in, in actual fact, they could afford to do that. And by looking at the plan and, you know, giving her peace of mind, she was able to see that they could easily afford and, you know, and take the family on this vacation. And of course, we have people on the other side of that that are going ahead and doing things that they really probably shouldn't be doing. So you know, either way, it's better to know what the facts are. Um, doing the plan allows you to make the most of your assets and it also allows you to avoid disaster. You know, Making sure you have money set aside in an emergency fund for a rainy day is super important. Um, making sure you have adequate insurance. You know, I actually, you know, literally set my house on fire in 2012. And I was, you know, you know it's something that I never thought would happen to me. But, uh, you know, it was, I was really, really happy at that point that I did have adequate insurance. So, you know, I had to deal with the hassle of what happened, but at least I wasn't, you know, it wasn't financial disaster. Um, some of my favorite quotes, you know, about doing the plan or just planning in general, you know, that. They apply to a lot of different things, um, not just finances, but failing to plan is planning to fail. I love that one. And then there's the one in general in life, you know, you want to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. 
make sure you've got your insurance, make sure you know, you've got your, your rainy day fund and hopefully you'll never need any of those things, but better to have it planned just in case. Um, a goal without a plan is just a wish. You know, I could wish that uh, I have $5 million in my investment account when I retire, but unless I've got a plan to get there, it's most likely not going to happen. Um, my favorite one by Spike Lee is, you know, I ain't Martin Luther King. I don't need a dream. I have a plan. You know, planning is super important. And Warren Buffett, you know, someone sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. You know, basically just pointing out that the decisions and the actions that you take now are going to have a, a huge impact, especially with, you know, compound interest and investments. Little things that you do now are going to have a huge difference in the future. You know, skipping a couple of Starbucks, that really could impact you over the long run. So what's in a financial plan? What do you need to be looking at? Um, cash flow management, which is essentially just looking at what's coming in versus what's going out. You know, where's the money coming from? We look at, you know, what you're going to be getting for Social Security, what income you have, money coming from anywhere else versus money going out. What are you spending? You know, what's your mortgage? What are your expenses? How are they going to change? Are you saving for college education? That sort of thing. Um, you got to make sure you look at your taxes, you know, and, and think about those things. You know, it, it sounds great. You may look at your, your IRA and have a million dollars in your IRA, but don't forget, you got to pay taxes on that when you take it out. So we always have to have in the back of our mind as we're looking at our, our future, you know, the impact that taxes are going to have. We look at the investment management side of it. How do you have, you know, a lot of people have accounts in different places. So by doing a financial plan, we can aggregate all of those accounts. Some of them we may be managing, but some of them may be somewhere else. We aggregate all of those together and we can look at your asset allocation and say, okay, you know, why, why do you have 50% in cash? Does that make sense? Or, you know, why do you have 95% in equities? Are you really comfortable with that? So we do the whole investment management side of it. Um, Retirement planning, as I said earlier, you know, do you know when you're going to retire? Are you going to be able to afford to when you, you know, to retire then? You know, I would love to retire at 60. Is that going to happen? Probably not. You know, I'm probably going to retire at 65. But by looking at the plan, I can see and then I can adjust my expectations accordingly. Education planning, you know, I have a, a daughter who's a high school senior, and um, and the, the costs of, of college are, are just astounding. So, um, you know, it's much better to start planning um, when your children are little and let the assets grow for you to try and keep up with the costs um, of college. We look at insurance, both from the life insurance perspective, make sure, you know, you have, that, that you have enough there to cover in the case of um, something um, unforeseen happening. And also, you know, is your house properly insured? All different aspects of, um, of insurance. And then also the, the final part of the estate plan is to make sure, you know, a lot of people don't want to say on Tuesday was really just the a lot of people don't want to think about party. what's going to happen after after they die. But, um, you know, that is something that you have to think about. And, and Lauren's going to talk about that in a minute. So going through the financial plan, um, the steps are, you know, the first thing that we do is calculate your net worth. So, so come up with a balance sheet. You know, what are your assets worth? What are your liabilities? You know, assets um, and liabilities put together, come up with your net worth. And, you know, what we like to do is, you know, I like to look at it at, at the end of a year and then it's a snapshot in time and then look at it again, you know, the following year and see how that has changed. You know, hopefully it's going up and not going down. Um, we set the financial goals that I talked about earlier um, and then create a budget. Budget is um, really important and um, something to think about. And this is a great time of year to be doing a budget because, you know, it, you know, you, at this point in time, you can, for example, go into American Express and download the summary for the year, you know, and see. And they, they actually do a really good job of, of, of organizing what, what you've spent the money on. And, um, you know, January is probably the, the, the day that everybody does, the, does their budget. And then going forward, once you've set your budget, you want to be tracking it and make sure that you're, you know, adhering to it and adjust it if necessary. I talked about you have to plan for your taxes. For savings, you want to build an emergency fund. And a lot of people with um, the pandemic that we're dealing with, with at the moment, 
you know, that's been really important for them. You know, some people have lost their jobs. So we find in general, the rule of thumb is if you have two earners, like if both, um, if both spouses are working, then, you know, you should probably have at least um, three months there where if it's only one spouse is working, you probably want to have six months of, um, of expenses in savings. Um, we always take a look at what people have in debt. And if anybody has high interest debt, you want to pay off credit cards and take care of those things first. Uh, we want to look at insurance. We talked about the investment strategy, the estate planning, and then monitor and review. Once we finish the plan, you know, we, we, we get all the information from the client or what you would do if you were doing it yourself is gather all this information together, come up with the plan, and then you know, review it on a regular basis. There's not a lot of point in doing one of these if you're gonna put it in a drawer and never look at it again. You wanna like have it as an ongoing plan and look at it um, at least annually. Um, some general tips and no brainers. Um, we talked about having an emergency fund. Um, the second one here, spend less than you earn. That sounds fairly simple, but isn't always as, as easy as it sounds, you know? We, most of us on this call, I'm sure live in a, uh, a very expensive area of the country. Um, if you have kids, you end up spending things. I have unforeseen expenses that come up that sometimes I haven't even thought about. So um, I, I, you know, we try and, and, and spend less than we earn. We wanna be saving um, at least 10%. Um, you know, that there's different uh, opinions on that, but I would say as a minimum, you wanna be saving at least 10%. One of the best things to do is to automate your savings. So, you know, if I had to remember to write a check or like to audit, even if I had to go onto a website and do it, put the money from checking into savings every month, I probably wouldn't do it. So what you wanna do if you can is just automate everything so you don't even have to think about it. You just say, okay, um, I want this money to be taken out of my paycheck, you know, to go into the 401k plan or, you know, you can automate things to go into taxable savings accounts as well. You always, no brainer, take full advantage of any employer 401k match. That is basically free money. Um, so, you know, if you have a 401k match, make sure you're taking advantage of it. Um, I mentioned compound interest earlier. Um, you know, the power of compound interest is astounding. Um, the earlier you invest, the better. Um, you know, I've actually, you know, I'm putting together a session to talk to my, my, my daughter who's 17 and some of her friends just to go over some of these things about investing and why it's so important and things I wish I had known about um, when I was much younger that I, I didn't find out till later. Um, one of the things that I find really helpful is um, pausing 24 hours before a large purchase. Um, you know, it's very easy to get carried away, uh, especially I have to say with COVID going on, you know, I, I know numerous people that have got a little um, online retail addiction going so if you're going to spend any significant money, probably good just to wait 24 hours before you do it. Um, for life insurance, it varies on your situation or where you are in life, but um, a lot of people say, you know, 10 to 12 times your income you should have in life insurance. And a, an umbrella liability insurance is always, or usually it's always a good thing to have in case something happens. So those are just some things for you to think about. This is, I talked earlier about the balance sheet. Um, so calculating your net worth. And this is just an example of one that I would do at work. So this is for a couple of the tailors and it just looks at um, you know, all their assets, their bank accounts, the, their home, their tangible assets, their jewelry, for example, um, any fine art that they might have. And then you know, take out, the, they have a, a 500,000 mortgage, which you wanna take out and this is what you know, shows the, the net worth. So you look at your balance sheet now, it's a snapshot in time, look at it again in the future and, um, and, and see which direction it's heading. This is the cash flow that I talked about earlier. Um, there's a lot of numbers on this page and it, it looks complicated, but this is actually my favorite page um, in the financial planning that we do. It shows you on the left, the years going down and it shows you the age of the clients. Um, and then you just work your way across. It shows the income coming in um, and it shows that, so it shows you the total inflows that you have. And then it shows you the total of expenses 
And it's great when I'm, I'm doing this on the software because you can drill down in any of these things and, and show the client, you know, what are the expenses made up of or where's the income coming from? In this case, it's probably coming from salary and bonus until, you know, they turn, uh, you know, to, until 2045 when um, Social Security probably is hitting. Um, and over on the right, it shows you the total portfolio assets. So this is showing you, you know, based on the money coming in, the money going out and the growth of portfolio, what's happening to your assets over time. And this is really where you can get peace of mind. Um, obviously it's an estimate and it's based on, um, you know, looking at the asset classes that you own and what those assets have done historically. Um, so this is not a guarantee that these people are gonna end up with $7 million, but it's a reasonable um, estimate uh, if they stick to what their plan is and if the market doesn't do something completely different than it's done in the past. And we tend to be very conservative when we're doing this. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd rather err on the side of caution when doing the plan than being too optimistic. So um, that's what we do. Um, this is just another um, one of the aspects of the planning that we do that I particularly like is this is show this is um, the education planning. So this shows you, you know, these, these people here have been saving, they've saved up a certain amount in their um, 529 plans. And it shows you, you know, in these years, in 2029, when they start paying for college, how much of it is gonna be covered by what they've saved and how much of it are they gonna to have to come up with? So they can, you can see here that, you know, our estimate is that for, for their daughter's college, they're gonna be, you know, 76, thousand underfunded that they're going to have to come up with from somewhere else. So that's just an example of some of the things that, that, that we do as part of the plan. Um, and again, you don't have to do it with a, a financial planner. It, it, you know, if you can, that's great. I think, you know, we can probably add to what you could do at home, but you can also, you know, just if you, if you don't want to, like, you know, pay to get the plan done, then you can like just address all of these things on your own. Um, so to recap a little bit, um, I can't stress how important I think that doing the financial planning is, um, you know, you speak to a lot of people, or I speak to a lot of our clients and I'm like, well, how do you spend, how much do you spend on a monthly basis? And, you know, people just don't know, um, you know, and, and that is, it, it's just, uh, it, it, it's not good. I think doing the plan, um, it's going to lead to success in the future. Either way, it's going to make sure you've got all your bases covered. It's going to make sure that you avoid disaster. It's going to reduce your stress. It really is, you know, it reduces my stress. And it's going to make you feel empowered, like being on top of things, like even getting things, it's the same as getting things organized at your house. You know, you feel better if you declutter and get everything organized. And on the financial side, getting on top of everything and, and, and having it all written down, even if it's not exactly what you want to see it makes you feel better and you can move forward from there. So um, I think that this is a great time for everybody to be thinking about their finances and getting organized. And another thing that, um, that is, you know, it would be good to be thinking about at the moment is making sure that your estate planning um, documents are all set. And I'm gonna stop sharing now and turn this over to Lauren and um, she's gonna talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Allie, and hello, everybody. Just give me a minute to get my screen up and going here. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, so thank you, Allie and Haven. My name is Lauren Davies. I'm an attorney at Fullman and Comley in their Trust and Estates Department. And I help people uh, with their wills and estate planning, um, and also with probate and estate settlement after the loss of a loved one. Um, so in, in English, I'm helping people either plan for death um, or cope with it after somebody has passed. And um, since it's a new year, thankfully, I'm very excited about that. Um, it's a good it's a good time to make sure all of your affairs are in order, as Ali said. And part of that um, is uh, your estate planning. So this afternoon, I'm going to outline the basic parts of an estate plan, and we're also going to talk about how to assess when an existing plan needs to be updated. Let's see if I can get this 
slide to go here. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is wills. Um, a will is properly a last will and testament. Um, it's a document that states where your assets go after you pass. Um, it also names um, an executor, uh, which is the person that speaks for the will and for the estate of the person that's died. Uh, and, and wills can be from everything from very, very simple to um, incredibly complex and everything in between. Um, so what happens if you don't have a will? Uh, if you don't have a will, then there's a statute and the assets pass by the law of the state that the person lived in when they die. Um, the, the long story short on that is if you don't have a will, then you don't control where your assets go on your death. So who needs one? Um, anybody who wants to control what happens to their assets on their death should have a will. Um, your assets are yours. They're hard earned. Um, and everybody um, deserves to be able to say where they want them um, to go and uh, understand what's in their planning documents. Uh, the next thing I wanted to cover was what do you need in your will if you have young, young children? This is a, a question that I get a lot. Um, and uh, the answer is, is two things. One is guardians. Um, and guardians are uh, people that you name in your will, um, which is who you want to have custody of your children. Who do you want them to live with? Um, who's going to take care of them until they grow up? Uh, and, and when we do planning for people and we go through all of this, we really like to see, to plan for as many possible contingencies as we can, because we don't have a crystal ball. So who's your first pick for guardians? Who's your second pick? Who's your third pick? And let's, let's put them all down. Um, the other thing you really need if you have young children is um, well, you need a con what's called a contingent trust for minors. Um, this means that you don't want to give your two-year-old or your four-year-old access outright. So who's going to, I think somebody is off of mute, maybe. Um, yeah, um, I, Ann Cassidy, if you could just mute, we can't mute you. Thank you. Oh, still got, is it better? I may have to remove her. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if I can't mute her. I can't mute her either. Okay, that sounds that sounds better. Um, okay, so we were talking about what do you need in your will if you have minor children. Um, the first part was guardians. The next part um, is uh, something called a contingent trust for minors. Um, you know, sometimes we do this when we're doing more complex planning and using trusts. Um, but we also do it in the most simple, um, straightforward planning and right inside a will. Um, and uh, how it works is you name somebody that you want to be the gatekeeper for the money. Um, and that person is called a trustee. Um, so you need somebody that's going to physically care for your children. That's the guardian. And somebody who's going to uh, make sure the money is used on their behalf um, and properly um, until whatever age you say you want to give control over to them. Um, and that's called a contingent trust for minors. So the next, the next piece is what assets pass by will. Um, this is something I get questions about a lot um, and where a lot of people get confused. Um, the answer is solely owned assets pass by will. Uh, so that's a checking account in your own name, a house you own in your own name. Um, be a car that you have in your own name. Uh, if you own your house jointly with your spouse, um, by the title of that um, house, when you pass, if your spouse is living, um, it's going to automatically go to that person just by virtue of the title. So it won't go by will, it goes by title. Um, that uh, good thing to keep in good thing to keep in mind. Um, assets that have beneficiary designations, and we're going to touch on this um, a little bit later in the presentation, um, also don't pass by will as long as they have a beneficiary designation that's properly filled out. So that's things like um, life insurance, um, a lot of uh, investment accounts or retirement assets all have the option to have 
beneficiary designations. And if those beneficiaries designations are filled in uh, properly, they're binding, whether they're right or not, they're binding. Um, so the will is really a, a catch all bucket for everything for everything else. Um, but it's important to remember that you need to think about the whole picture, not just the will to make sure that all of your assets go where you want them to go when you pass. Um, the last piece in here is what happens if my will isn't executed properly or it doesn't reflect my wishes. Um, so that's it's really two questions. So the answer to the, the first one, if it's not executed properly, um, then you don't, uh, it's not valid. And either uh, if you had a prior will, um, then that one would would pop back up again, um, which which you know may or may not be um, okay or appropriate, um, but that's what would happen. Um, if you didn't have a prior will, then you would be back to just not having a will at all, and then it would just pass by operation of of law. Um, and if it doesn't accurately reflect your wishes, but it's properly executed, um, your loved ones are just stuck with that. Um, you know, either way, it's not good. And, and unfortunately, it, it, um, that kind of thing doesn't usually get seen until um, after somebody's passed by their um, loved ones. So moving on to the next slide. Um, okay, so advanced directives and um, living wills. This is a topic that's um, uh, been on, on everybody's mind since the pandemic started. Uh, an advanced directive um, is uh, the name for a document that has a living will in it. It also has um, some other pieces in it, including uh, a healthcare representative, um, which is who you want to make medical decisions for yourself. Um, it names uh, a conservator should you ever need one, which is like a court appointed medical representative. Um, it states your preferences re regarding organ donation um, and who you want to have custody and control over your remains. Um, you know, all pretty heavy topics, but, but important things to think about. Um, so uh, just going down the list of questions here, um, who's gonna make medical decisions for you if you can't make them yourself? Um, that's your healthcare representative. Um, and when you make an advance directive, um, you control who you want to make those decisions for you. Um, and um, with all of these choices, the will here in the advance directives um, and where we're going next, it's just important to remember that, you know, whether you're married or not married or whatever your family structure, it, uh, your family structure is, um, these decisions are yours and you should understand, um, you know, what you have and if you don't like what you have that you have the power to change it. Uh, so the next thing is what is a living what is a living will? A living will is an optional statement that can go in your advanced directives that um, says uh, what your preferences are regarding end of life care. Um, I practice law in Connecticut. Um, we aren't like I'm sure you've heard of some states like Oregon which are um, right to die states. This is in Connecticut, we can't, we don't do the pull the plug thing. Um, but you can say that um, you don't, if a doctor determines that your condition is terminal, that you don't want your life um, prolonged, but that you do want to be kept comfortable. Um, a living, there's some general language for living wills, uh, but it can also be customized to your, to your wishes. Um, and another uh, frequently asked question that I that I get when I'm going through these things with people is what happens if I don't have a living will? Um, and this is um, something really important to understand, um, which is that the then the decisions made by your healthcare representative, if you have one. Um, so so the, the living will um, is a binding statement um, and it, it's especially useful to have if you don't have um, somebody to name as your healthcare representative that you're sure understands your wishes. Um, so for some people, as they go through life at certain times in their life, they have those people. Um, and, and sometimes they wanna take the living wills out because they um, trust their representative to make decisions for them. And sometimes, um, sometimes, sometimes not. There's no right or wrong answers with any of this. It's just um, you know, personal um, preference and being able to make an informed choice. 
Um, so the impact of the pandemic on the living will, um, they're still they're still valid. Um, there is a piece in the standard living will um, language uh, where some people opt to um, not um, ha have use of things like um, ventilators or CPR and things like that. So we have seen some requests for people carving um, carving those things out of the living will since um, some people feel that they're more likely, it's more likely to come up um, in the uh, context of uh, COVID. Um, <coughs> excuse me, that's personal preference as well. Um, and the last one is what if I'm pregnant or become pregnant? Um, a couple years ago, uh, the law was changed regarding this and now there's an optional pregnancy provision where you can have a living will and then underneath it say, um, if I'm pregnant, either I want the living will to be followed no matter what, um, or um, I don't want the living will to be followed no matter what, or something in between. So next, the next piece um, of, of a basic estate plan is the power of attorney. And the power of attorney is a, a document that states uh, who's going to make financial decisions for you. Um, and uh, it's both when a power of attorney is signed, it's valid from that day forward, and then it survives your incapacity. Um, it's important to note um, that most powers of attorney are do go into effect when you sign them, as do the rest of these <coughs> excuse me, documents. So um, I've already answered that first piece, but who makes the financial decisions if you can't make them yourself? Um, the answer is your power of attorney if you've named one. Um, and um, what, you know, what is it? Um, it's uh, broad and sweeping financial powers that allow another person to step into your shoes um, and act as you uh, for everything financial. Um, so um, moving money around, paying your mortgage. Um, it can even include uh, estate planning powers that would allow somebody to change a, um, change a trust, fund a trust, change beneficiary designations on your 401k. Um, so you can imagine all the ways that that could go um, wrong and how important it is to have the right person or people named. Um, so how long does it last? Um, so, so they don't um, end unless they're actually revoked. So even if you have an old power of attorney, technically speaking, um, at least in Connecticut, it's still good. Uh, but, but if it's stale or more than, you know, I'd say four or five years old, um, it's a good idea to refresh it because, uh, you know, while, while a lawyer is going to know that it's still good, uh, sometimes the people um, who you need to actually present it to don't know that and you can have some um, some trouble trying to give or use an old power of attorney at um, your local bank um, or wherever it else it might need to be used. Um, and the last question here, what if I need to change my power of attorney? Um, you need to actually formally revoke it. Um, you know, telling um, you know your brother that you don't want him to be your power of attorney anymore. Um, and you know that he knows that um, isn't isn't going to do it. Um, it needs to be formally uh, revoked, and then you won't have one, or um, revoked in place of a new power of attorney. Okay. So next up is beneficiary designations. Um, we touched on this uh, just a little bit uh, earlier. Um, uh, this is probably the most confused um, part of estate planning that, that I see um, on, on a regular basis. Um, and so just to recap, beneficiary designations are binding statements that are made on some financial assets like uh, life insurance, um, investment accounts, um, retirement benefits, um, those kinds of things. Um, it's a form that you fill out where you, you say where you want that asset to go when you die. Um, and, and sometimes, um, especially if people are doing some planning on their own, um, you know, maybe they do a new will, but nobody asked them about the beneficiary designations or they tried to do the will on their own and they didn't update the beneficiary designations. And then when they die, it turns out they either had their ex-spouse named or only two out of their three or four children, um, or um, you know, uh, just the assets go somewhere 
uh, where you don't want them to go. Um, and and when I see that happen, when somebody comes to me to do probate work after somebody's died, um, and you know the first thing we ask for is the list of um, assets from the month in which the person passed, um, and we want to see the beneficiary designations because that's how we know where those assets are going to go. Um, and if they're wrong, there's really very little you can do. So if you only remember one thing from my presentation, it's to check your beneficiary designations and make sure that they're updated. Uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on this morning was, was trusts. And, and I'm just going to just hit this for a minute or two because it's really, um, it's a rabbit hole all on its, all on its own. Um, and, you know, the, even at a basic level, the subject of its own presentation. But for, for any folks that are listening that, that don't really know what trusts are or how they're used, um, there's, there's two major categories um, uh, that are the, you know, the kind of the big two reasons why we use trusts. One is if somebody, uh, is if somebody has uh, a possibly taxable estate. Um, so uh, what is that? So um, there are, I'm sure you've, you've maybe heard of things called, there's estate tax exemptions. And that's the amount that one person can pass to another person um, on death without having to pay tax. Um, right now, federally for 2021, it's $11.7 million per person. So that's, that's very, very high. Um, they've never been that high before. And there's a lot of talk about um, how those numbers may change, especially with the new administration coming in um, in, a few, in a few weeks, um, just to give you a, a uh, some context. Um, I think Biden's current plan calls uh, for something in the neighborhood of $3.5 million um, each. Connecticut has its own numbers, um, but, but just to keep this um, kind of simple and high level for today, um, if you have, if you might possibly incur estate tax, then there's things that we can do in, trust to, in trusts to make sure um, that uh, your estate isn't taxed more than it needs to be. The second reason we use trusts is to take control away from a beneficiary. So um, that could be as simple as um, a minor child, um, like we talked about in the beginning, um, who can't, you know, shouldn't control his or her assets. Um, or it could be for an adult who um, maybe has trouble with alcohol or trouble with money or a bad spouse or um, you fill in the blank. Um, so those are the two major categories uh, for why uh, trusts are needed or used. Um, so just to, um, to recap here, these are the, the five basic pieces of, um, of an estate plan. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanted to hit was um, if you have a plan, um, how often does it need to be updated or reviewed? Uh, and we tell people, um, you know, depending on, on age, um, every two to three years um, or major change in circumstances. So births, deaths, marriages, divorces, um, major change in wealth. Um, if you move to a new state, um, because the planning is state specific, um, all those things are reasons um, to pull it out, reread it um, and have it, have it reviewed. Um, and I always tell people that I'm working with that um, I follow the law, but I don't know what's happening um, in anybody's life. Um, uh, and, and that's, you know, true um, kind of across the, the board, um, unless somebody tells me. So um, if any of those things, you know, happen, you got to pick up the phone and, and tell the lawyer that you were working with, otherwise they wouldn't know. Um, and the same thing about changes in the law. Um, we follow the changes in the law. Um, but you know, we need to know what's happening in our clients' lives to make sure that we know whether it affects them or not. And so with that, I'm gonna open this up to some questions so that we can um, hear what's on everybody's minds. Hey, um, if you wanna stop sharing, I do see that there's some questions in chat and I could, um... Do you want me to read the questions in chat, or are you good to read? Hold that? on, I see, the, I see the. I see the. I see. There's one for me from Michelle. Um, yes. Yes. Hi. Um, 
first of all, Allie and Lauren, thank you for great presentations, very informative. Really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, so Allie, you mentioned, I had two questions and I promise to be brief. Um, you mentioned your firm does both planning and investments. Can you just explain that um, a little more in depth, what that means? Sure. Um, so we are a registered investment firm. So we have the, our clients bring um, their portfolios to us and we manage them on the investment side. So in addition to that, we do financial planning for their clients. So I, you know, there's, there's a bunch of people doing the investments, then there's three of us on the planning side. So I will sit down um, and do the plan for our clients. And then we'll have somebody on the investment side that will work together as a team so, you know, we make sure that their investments are, you know, their assets are invested in the correct way that they're, you know, they have the most likelihood of, of reaching the goals that we've come up with in the plan. And it, it's good because it's a team approach, you know, covering sort of the whole financial big picture, not just the investments, but, but all the rest. So, you know, clients call us for any kind of um, financial question that they might have. Um, some people like to talk in depth about their investments and some people want to talk about whether they should rent or buy a new car. So, you know, it, that, that, that's the way we work uh, hand in hand together. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and just a real simple question. I don't know if anyone else, um, it made me think of this while you were speaking. Um, when I look at my monthly take home pay after taxes, is there a certain percentage? I remember reading about it, a certain percentage I should set aside for my rent and mortgage and it shouldn't be over that amount. Yeah, um, Michelle, the rule of thumb for that is 28% is of your, your pre-tax monthly income on housing. And then your total debt payments shouldn't exceed an absolute maximum of 40%, but it's much better if you can keep it closer to 33%. So, you know, people's situations vary, but that's the, the general rule of thumb. Thank you. That's probably not the answer I wanted to hear. It's kind of scary, but... Um... Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. So I'll let the, um, Lauren answer the other questions. But again, thank you for your time. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I don't know if everybody gonna see, can see it, so I'm gonna read it. Um, so uh, the first question is, what does not properly executed, what does a not properly executed will mean? Um, so, and, and I'm just gonna answer under um, Connecticut law. And if you're in a different state, um, it, may be, it may be different, but in Connecticut, um, there's statutory formalities. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to read the questions here, but um, you, essentially you need to um, make sure that the statutory questions have been read to you and answered uh, in front of two witnesses and a notary. Um, so there's two witnesses and a notary, but it's not just, um, it's not just that. There's also uh, questions that need to be read and um, answers and answered to be valid under Connecticut law. And then there's an affidavit um, that needs to be signed by the witnesses. Um, so if all of that isn't done in accordance with Connecticut law just right and somebody challenges it um, or the probate court notices when the will's filed, um, then the will will be deemed invalid. Uh, okay, so the second, the second question is, uh, oh, it's part of the same thing. And it just says if it's not properly witnessed or signed, for example, yes. Um, but could be other things, could be other things as well. Um, the next question is, can you have more than one person listed as power of attorney at once? Not necessarily contingent, yes. Um, it, the answer to that is yes. You can name two people together, even three people together, although three people starts to get um, a little bit bulky and cumbersome. Um, but you can name two people either jointly or severally. So jointly means two names on every check. The decisions have to be made by the two people together on everything. Um, severally means they can divide and conquer. And uh, for example, if you have two siblings and they're taking care of mom and everybody gets along really well and trusts everybody, the two siblings can be named severally and share the burden. And so, you know, brother um, is going to deal with things regarding the house and, um, you know, and sister is going to deal with management of um, assets or whatever the, whatever the case may be. Uh, you can also name backups. Um, uh, so there's an infinite variation number of uh, ways we can vary 
how many people we name in each of those roles. And it's, it's actually true, not just of power of attorney, but also of um, all the fiduciary roles. So executor, trustee, healthcare representative, all, all those things. Um, we can customize, you know, any um, estate planning attorney can customize um, for people what works best for them. Uh, what do you think about, the last question is, what do you think about library notaries? Um, so a notary um, public is uh, uh, a position that it's not an attorney, it's just somebody who has um, learned what the rules are regarding being a notary. Um, and it's really only about making sure that the person who is signing is actually that person. Um, so there's no legal advice involved or anything else. And there's notaries in all kinds of positions in all kinds of places. Um, you should just, you know, know that that what that person's doing when they notarize a, a document um, is um, making sure that that it's actually you. So they either need to know you personally or see um, proof of identification uh, because their signature below yours, you know, is is saying it was really, um, you know, so and so that was that was here to sign today. But it has nothing to do with what's in the documents. <laughs>